Um, so, all right, we can start. Uh, Jack, can you just this type in? All right. We affirm contention one is drones. Whitlock 14 explains that the US military is relying on bases in the Persian Gulf to carry out airstrikes in Iraq. Additionally, Terse 11 contextualizes the Aludate Air Base in Qatar is critical to the drone wars in Afghanistan and Pakistan. The US has given up on attempts to be precise with drone strikes. Boyle 2013. The standards of proportionality have been eroded with drone warfare as the US has engaged in attacks that kill more civilians than combatants. The deliberate targeting of civilian events are neither proportionate nor justifiable and would constitute war crimes. Two impacts. The first is civilian deaths. Ryan 18 quantifies the the U.S. and allied strikes against the Islamic State killed as many as 6,000 civilians in 2017 alone. In fact, structural factors mean that deaths are much higher than figures say. As Boyle 13 explains, con uh, government officials assert without evidence that, the that those killed were, mil uh, were militants. The tallies of civilian deaths are thus much higher. Second is state collapse. Drone attacks systematically undermine governments and increase the probability of state failure. Boyle 13 writes that drone attacks weaken governments, undermine their legitimacy, and add to the ranks of their enemies. The popular perception is that government is that, is that a government is powerless to stop drone attacks on its territory will embolden its domestic rivals to challenge it through violence. State failure spills over and creates massive conflict. Fear in, uh, fear in 15 explains that... Uh, that uh, state collapse and failure raise the risk of civil wars and state failures in the region that are important for stability. Refugees refugees strain neighboring states, economies, and political balances. Regional conflict over failed states increases militarization, support for insurgents, and risks of and risks of regional interstate military conflicts. Contention to is Yemen. Has been 19 explains that uh, that uh, benefiting from the U.S. security umbrella anchored by its bases around the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE have attempted to organize the region through military interventions. They launched with U.S. support an ineffective war against the Houthi rebels in Yemen. After America withdraws troops from the Gulf, Saudi Arabia no longer has the security umbrella that enables adventurism into Yemen. This will cause them to turn to a negotiated solution to the conflict as current conditions are ripe for an agreement. Hanley of March 2020 explains that the war has been costly both in financial terms and in the international reputation of Saudi Arabia. The Saudis would likely agree to having the Houthi share in power with the Saudi-supported Hadi government. This is true empirically. Parsi 2020 explains that recognizing that the U.S. military was no longer at their disposal, Saudi Arabia began exercising its diplomatic options. They stepped up direct talks with the Houthi rebels, and the level of violence declined as a result, resulting in an 80% reduction in Saudi-led airstrikes. A power-sharing agreement is critical. Wiesman 18 explains that the fighting in the blockade in particular has disrupted imports of food, fuel, and medical supplies, which is why Landry in 2019 concludes the U.N. has described Yemen as the world's worst humanitarian emergency with 10 million people on the brink of famine. Contention 3 is a U.S.-Iran war. Aggressive foreign policy has put America and Iran on a collision course. Coronavirus is making the war in the Middle East even more likely. Germanos from April explains that Donald Trump threatened to attack Iran and make the country pay a heavy price. With gold pandemics and, and the economic collapse, Trump wants to add a major war into the mix. K in 2020 continues that some in the administration seek to use the COVID-19 crisis to capitalize on Iran's increased vulnerability. Withdrawing troops from Iran's backyard reduces the probability of U.S.-Iran war for two reasons. First is provoking Iran. Continued military presence risks miscalculation and provocation of Iran. Abado in 2020 explains that U.S. fears of an imminent large-scale attack on its soldiers in Iraq is entirely valid. Iraq, Iran seems ready to do whatever it takes to drive American troops out of the country immediately. The escalation by U.S. troops and the Iran-backed militias is putting Iraq at risk of an all-out military conflict. This trims down the possible scenarios for the U.S. future in Iraq to only two, all-out war or a departure sooner rather than later. Absent a U.S. threat of invasion, Iran will cease its escal escalatory actions. As Trevino in 2013 explains, while Iran has supported the Islamic Revolution, these actions do not create a network of offensive capabilities to become a hegemon. Instead, the focus of the new regime is survival, not expansion. Second is a shift to diplomacy. America's approach to Iran has become overwhelmingly informed by aggression, as Jones 11 confirms the challenge has been treated almost entirely through the lens of militarism. Withdrawing troops sends a signal that the U.S. will shift to diplomacy. Hard 19 explained that peaceful coexistence requires the will to talk and compromise, and a war, a war, a U.S. Iran war would be devastating. As Chusadovsky in 2018 finds that a nuclear holocaust over the large part of the Middle East and Central Asia involving millions of civilian casualties will happen, and even if nuclear weapons are not used, bombing of nuclear facilities will release nuclear fallout, killing millions. Thus we affirm. Um, can you send the Oh, can you send the impact evidence? And then can I also see uh, war in Yemen was caused with you uh, with US support? And sorry, the impact evidence on second contention.
Uh, are y'all running prepper? What's up? I haven't gotten the card yet. Aren't you allowed to run prepper while y'all are pulling up cards? Under DSC rules, I thought. Uh, no, I, th I think it's already been sent, hasn't it? Oh, oh, did you send it? I don't think I got it. Yeah, I, I, even got it. I sent it, yeah. You know, check spam, maybe. I just replied to the Yeah, it came through for me. No, it's in my spam. Oh, yeah, yeah it's in spam too, sorry. All right, so sorry, we'll start. Let me just get my timer and we'll start. All right, so starting now. Hey, that was 27 seconds. Sorry. Um Worst case. Nueva negates our sole contention is moderating Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has a deep-rooted mistrust in Iran that inhibits peace from spreading to the Persian Gulf. This fear is rooted in history. Marcus 19 of BBC warns that after the 79 Iranian revolution, Saudi Arabia perceived that Iran was exporting a revolutionary model of Islam that could inspire a revolution within Saudi Arabia, challenging the royal family's hold on power. When threatened, Saudi Arabia acts out on its insecurity, fighting deadly rebels and militias throughout the region in a series of proxy wars, drawing in outside actors like Iran from around the region. Withdrawing our military presence will reinforce Saudi uncertainty and cause proxy conflict in two ways. First, by magnifying internal uncertainty. Lock 18 of the CSM explains that the U.S.'s military support is the bedrock of the royal family security and stability. However, if domestic dissenters see the U.S. security relationship disintegrating, the Saudis will grow skeptical of existing leadership, potentially challenging Prince Salman's hold to power. In response to the political failure of American withdrawal, the Saudis will have no choice but to act aggressively to seem strong in front of a domestic domestic and regional audience. Lynch 16 of Carnegie Endowment explains that when domestic audiences question the regime's policies and policy failures, the Saudis seek to distract regional and domestic audiences with aggressive foreign policy to enhance the perception of strength during a tumultuous time. This lash out will take the form of proxy conflict. Lynch continues that it is well documented that Saudi Arabia views the ethnic proxy conflicts around the region as a strategic battleground to build domestic support and often mobilizes sectarian tension to quell domestic uncertainty. Second, by magnifying external uncertainty, Zecker 16 of the University of London finds that four deployed U.S. troops are one of the most effective ways to demonstrate security commitment because they intertwine American lives with allied interests, ensuring the U.S. will not retreat and abandon our allies. The loss of the security commitment would push our allies towards aggression, as Brands 18 of Bloomberg concludes that if the U.S. retreats from the Middle East, it would leave behind a more chaotic environment in which our allies feel forced to defend for themselves, lashing out to check back against external uncertainty. To see 18 of Princeton University furthers that today because Saudi leaders feel they are the last Arab country standing in the way of total Iranian regional dominance. They believe any compromises acquiescence by Iran's regional comp regional power. For these two reasons, U.S. military withdrawal has resulted in chaos in the Middle East. France 18 of Bloomberg adds empirically that at every point where the U.S. has begun the process of gradually drawing down its military presence in the region, Saudi Arabia has surged forward aggressively, backing proxy groups and starting conflicts to protect themselves as U.S. security assurance fades. Lead to three of Rice University quantifies that having a security partner committed to a state's defense decreases the probability of conflict initiation by 28%. Overall, both links demonstrate military presence stabilizes Saudi security perceptions and prevents them from starting and interfering in proxy conflict. That's why Goldenberg 17 of foreign policy confirms historically that nearly every proxy war in the region, including Syria, Bahrain, and Yemen, were all started due to Saudi insecurity in response to a gradually diminishing U.S. military presence. These wars have been deadly, as the Red Cross in 2018 writes, that due to proxy conflicts like Syria and Yemen, 50 million people are in need of aid and 19 million are displaced. Affirming now would collapse the region. D 
deep 18 at West Point finds that the very least the Gulf reaction to a U.S. withdrawal would be to fund Sunni proxy groups and fund some, like the fundamental milita fundamentalist militants in Syria and inter continue intervening in new conflicts like the unwieldy air campaign in Yemen. Supporting these militias is problematic as would 12 of the ASU finds that when third parties fund troops and proxy wars, casualties increase by 40% and the length of conflict increases by two and a half times. Expansions of proxy conflicts are deadly as love at 18 of the CFR finds there are five potential conflict cost flashpoints across the Persian Gulf where Saudi Arabia would look to expand and cause new conflicts, including Qatar, Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. Any escalation would be problematic, especially 16, as the New York Times quantifies that this regional escalation could kill up to 5 million through decades of proxy war and genocide. Um, can I see a couple of, uh, couple of cards? Um, actually, can I just see like the last card you read? I didn't catch the site. Um, then I, then can I see, uh, the, the leads of three evidence. Those are the two cards I need. Last one you read and leads. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, one sec. Set. Okay. Wait, am I unmuted? No, okay, good. Uh, hasn't come through for me, but I'll start prepping once it has. Okay, cool. Um, I'll start taking prep now. Okay, cool. 10 seconds used. For cross. Are you ready for cross or? Yeah. Okay. So, um, go. yeah, sure. Okay, so you read me evidence in your second link that says that historically or like empirically, Saudi Arabia has increased support for proxies um, when they were like threatened with losing their security guarantee. So not what threatened. Is, or when, when the security when the security guarantee decreased, so, Saudi Arabia lashed out. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I get your point. Cool. I was going to say that. So what specific proxy? Like where did that happen? Like what specific? Yemen, yeah, Syria, Iraq. Every oh, proxy war on the status quo has been caused by military drawbacks. That's Goldenberg and Brands. Wait, hold on, hold on. Yemen? Yes. Then, Yemen was caused because then, they felt then, the U.S. was pulling away military assurances. Then why did why did the last time the U.S. threatened... Your evidence that you read on your case about Yemen confirms this assertion. No. The fact that the United States threatened Saudi Arabia, to pull The evidence away, you sent me on the email chain says Saudi Arabia went in first and then the U.S. followed them. I, I don't know what you're, I'm talking about the Parsi evidence that I read, right? The Parsi evidence that I read- I don't the last care time about Parsi. I'm talking about every proxy war in the region has been started as a decrease of U.S. military security okay. guarantees. Can I have a question? Well, I know, I, then I have a follow-up then, right? Well, can we talk so, about your first contention about drones? Right, Do you I think any state to... collapse will happen? Where will state collapse happen? Can I just clear this up first? One second. So, oh, sure, yeah. Sorry, then, I thought, I thought you were done, so I apologize. Then why did the um, violence in Yemen decrease by 80% when the, United, the last time the US, United States threatened to withdraw? So, the violence in Yemen did not decrease by 80%. There was a small uh, blip and a decrease in airstrikes, and it only lasted for two weeks. In March, Saudi Arabia started, uh, started airstrikes again, which proves that all the diplomacy that you're talking about is probably short term. Uh, let's talk about your first touch about drones, state collapse, which state collapses in the Middle East? Um, well, a good, like a good example are like pretty much like all the proxies that are going on right now, like where we're using drones. But they're already failed states. Uh, what new states collapse? Failed states like because of drones. We'd say like new states, first of all, states are likely to well, collapse. There are, all the states in the status quo have collapsed already. So I'm asking what new states are you worried about? Um, because if we're right, we decrease right. the, we decrease okay. the chance okay. of any conflict. 
Pakistan, um, um, uh, Afghanistan, uh, Libya. Are okay, all so you're saying Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Libya are dependent on predator drone bases in the United States, not predator drone bases in Afghanistan. Yes, our evidence specifically indicates because you're evidence is talking about predator drones Afghanistan. carrying out strikes in Iraq. We have evidence yeah. saying that predator the drones are based card. in Afghanistan, which the is much closer card. to Pakistan and Afghanistan. The second card says that the Aludate Air Base <clears throat> in Qatar is where we launch all our drones to carry out drone strikes in Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. Can I ask a question? No. Okay, that's fine. Yes, you can read the card. I can send it to you. It's I know. Very right. close. Okay, that's fine. So um, let's talk about your uh, like diversion air war thing, right? So why does the in order to like um, get a domestic victory, why does he have to look outwards? Like why can't MBS do like more economic liberalization to appear to their to appeal to their young population? So, so it's not about the young population; it's about the Saudi royals. So there's like the Saudi royal family, which has like 800 princes in it. The argument well, is that without the U.S. security not, guarantee, MBS is no, no longer legitimized. That's less all, Your evidence is not That's about the royal family. But second of all, my That's question still stands. Like, he can do other things. I think, yeah, I think I answered it. It's not about I'm, the population. It's about the royal family. Can I see the drone strike evidence real quickly? Sorry to, sorry to interrupt the, from the Al Hudaydah Air Base in Qatar. Yeah. That that's where the drones are. Yeah. All right, I sent it. Are y'all taking prep or are you sending the evidence? Um, no, he's cool. sending the evidence. Sending we're, we're just waiting. To go through, uh, Should we, yeah. Okay, yeah, we're good. All right. Okay. Wait, oh, did it, did it go through? Yeah, I went through, I went through. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right, so it's, it's just going to be uh, Wang, then just like line by line their case. Um, probably flow the Wang on their case. Is everyone ready? All right. Our first contention of state collapse outweighs theirs in two ways. We say drone strikes eventually cause these states to collapse. First, on a prerequisite, Boyd explains when states collapse, it causes spillover violence and the proliferation um, of, uh, of violence in zones without governance means that proxy conflicts can flourish. Second, on reversibility, it takes more resources and political change to rebuild institutions of an entire collapse state than it takes to negotiate a peace, peace deal to a proxy conflict. Our second contention also outweighs on a risk of solvency. Lang 2020 describes the Yemen crisis as the worst humanitarian crisis in the world on faces a low likelihood that any new conflict Saudi Arabia creates will be worse. Focus, you should focus on solving Yemen first. They just assert without any warrant or historical examples that the reason why Yemen happened is because the U.S. with drew its troops, but that's the status quo, so that's a harm that they have to account for. Our third contention also outweighs for two reasons. First is on magnitude. Chizodowski 19 explains that U.S.-Iran war scenario would cause a nuclear holocaust over half the Middle East and kills millions more than any proxy wars would. That's our evidence from the case. But then secondly, U.S.-Iran war also turns proxy wars, and with the U.S. involved, they expand outside the Middle East, meaning we also outweigh on scope, because War 2020 explains that ruthless proxies spreading chaos on multiple continents. The U.S.-Iran war has the potential to be one of the worst conflicts in history. Let's group both of their contentions with a few generalized responses. Firstly, the ceasefire in Yemen is failing now. Even though preconditions for diplomacy are there, as Heap says in our case, the Karenin explains that the Houthis have violated the ceasefire 240 times. TRT of April 16th explains that Houthi noncompliance stems from Saudi refusal to make concessions and accept Houthi demands. That's why making Saudi, Saudi Arabia willing to negotiate is key to solving the problem. Secondly, turn the argument against them. The parsing empiric from our case about when Trump threatened to pull out proves that when Saudi Arabia is scared, they do diplomacy with regional actors like Iran and Israel, assuming America is out of the picture. They'll say that, that, that America started attacks again in March, but that was after we killed Soleimani, as Parsi says, 
and confirm the hawkish security guarantee and the conflict then resumes. But for this overall, there are other impairments because it postdates them by two years and assumes Trump's unpredictable foreign policy. Third, turn the argument. Failure to respond to Saudi condemnation causes emboldenment. To Tavi 18 explains that Trump stood by the crown prince even as U.S. military, military support came under attack. The administration emboldened people in Riyadh, giving it carte blanche to pursue more uh, aggressive policies. Fourth, the Trump administration makes leverage fail. Burns 19 explains that Trump's wildcat style diplomacy succeeded in undercutting the effectiveness of the State Department. Diplomatic efforts are undertaken by amateurs willing to give the president his way. But fifth, the U.S. can't control these allies. Shapiro in 2015 explains that GCC interests and U.S. interests increasingly diverge over issues. American officials convince themselves that they need to change U.S. policy more than Persian Gulf partners need to change theirs. But then, let's specifically talk about each one of their links. On the first link, about collapsing the legitimacy of the Saudi Arabian government. First, note they give zero warrant or contextualization why the legitimacy in the royal family depends on U.S. ties. Don't vote for an argument that misses a clear contextualized internal warrant. But then, uh, um, but then secondly, I would say that is not true at all. There's a lot of anti-U.S. sentiment in the Middle East generally, and that includes Saudi Arabia. I would sure, I would be sure that many of these people would prefer a, a self-sufficient Saudi Arabia as to one that is propped up by America. So it isn't true that this loss of legitimacy just forces them to lash out 100%. But third, they forget that it is a monarchy. They don't have to lash out for anyone. They face no domestic pressure because they don't have elections, and clearly they don't care about international pressure because all sorts of sanctions, international condemnation, didn't even affect how they uh, operated in the Yemen conflict. So really, pressure doesn't at all get to anyone in the Saudi uh, regime. On the second link about external uncertainty, again, the grouping answers both of these links. But let's answer a few of these specific claims that they make, beginning with the 2Z18 evidence about how basically uh, Saudi, like Saudi Arabia views any diplomacy as acquiescence. Again, Parsi postdates. Parsi uh, is from uh, is is from like two or three weeks ago. What what, uh, what what they say is that after these states thought the Saudis were going to pull out, the Saudi Arabians literally sit down and did diplomacy with Iran and Israel. That literally proves that Saudi Arabia does not rule out diplomacy in any case. They literally are 100% comfortable with conducting it. Um, but then on the Leeds evidence, they say that we decrease uh, like allied violence. That evidence is not specific to the US and it's almost like 20 years old. Don't value this argument. But then they read evidence that says the gradually diminishing US presence is the reason why these proxy wars were started. First, just an assertion. There is no warrant in the card for why this is true. But then, the, but then, secondly, again, that's the status quo. If our military presence is there and violence is getting worse, that proves we should take a different strategy based off of pulling out. All right, we're going to take preps. Sorry, now. I thought it was exactly two minutes. Total. So the order is going to be starting. Two minutes uh, total, right? Two minutes yeah, total. Two minutes total. Yeah. It's going to be starting with all the top level stuff on our case. We'll just find our case weighing on the top of their case and then down. Is everyone ready? Cool. 
on the first piece of weighing, they say state collapse is more important. A, recognize Syria and Yemen are already state collapse, which proves that more proxy wars have a very high probability of leading to proxy conflict. Second of all, they do not give you any specificity on this argument. They never say what states are going to collapse or how they're going to collapse. There's no actual warrant level analysis done on this argument. Value its proxy wars first because it's a much better empirical link of causing state failure. Then their second argument, the two warrants, one is a prerequisite because it leads to a proliferation of violence, no quantification of how much violence increases or where the violence increases. Then they say it takes more resources to negotiate. Proxy wars take the same amount of re resources to negotiate. Then they say, yeah, Yemen is worse. That doesn't matter. Johnson 18 finds that conflicts like Yemen are actually mostly already intractable. These conflicts are already locked in because the rebel groups on the ground are already locked into fighting. This means the only thing that matters is stopping future conflicts. Present conflicts are intractable. They say the status quo is just bad. That's not a binary. We tell you from our brand's evidence, the U.S. is slowly moving down, and then that leads to Saudi Arabia always slowly moving forward. It's not just truth or no truth. It's a steady movement of downward truth, which we've empirically seen has led to more aggression. Then on their next piece of weighing, they say nuclear holocaust kills a bunch of people, and it's really bad. Recognize that CNA 18 finds will never be a nuclear holocaust in the Middle East because any actor knows that if they strike, it will immediately have nuclear fall on themselves because the states are so close to each other. But second, oh, second, CNA also adds that even if Trump has a low-yield nuclear strike on Iran, at most it would kill 200,000 or 5 million, in fact, still outweighs. They say the Houthis have violated ceasefires and overall they can do regional diplomacy. Two things here. One, we are actually ahead here because the ICG finds that Trump uses leverage to actually stop a full-on Saudi invasion of Yemen, which killed 24 million, which stopped the killing of 24 million people. It's much better than their vague negotiations because it clearly shows a material impact of the conflict. But second, on the Parsi thing specifically. Remember, Parsi's negotiation he talks about happened two days before the perceived U.S. drawdown. Their, their timeline's all messed up. The negotiations happened before the U.S. pulled out, not after. Then they say that Trump is emboldened and Trump makes leverage fail. Once again, the appearance is proved. And they say Trump can't control his allies. Clearly, it's not just about how Trump acts. Rather, that's the existence of presence pulls our allies back. It doesn't matter about Trump. Go to our second link. We're dropping all the defense in our first and just going there. They say Parsi proves they negotiate. Remember, A, it was just two weeks of negotiations, and B, the, the strikes the, the resumed in March 30th, which obviously proves that nothing that there was no actual long-term peace which means that our 2 c evidence is also extended because it clearly tells you that saudi Arabia never wants to negotiate in the long run they say that our evidence is from the status quo no brent says and they completely mishandle this is that every time the u.s draws down we empirically see saudi arabia surge forward the historical precedent is really mishandled here the status quo is not binary it's nuanced when the u.s moves down saudi arabia moves up that's why we think you should not affirm to, to lock in more saudi arabia moving forward they say our leads evidence is 20 years old not specific to the u.s they don't interact with the war the war is that when we when a one country backs another country with a security partnership obviously applies to the u.s the probability of conflict decreases by 28 percent and they don't give a warrant as to why we can't evaluate it the entire impact scenario is dropped we tell you from deep saudi will saudi will fund more Sunni proxy groups um if the u.s goes away and that'll lead to five million deaths in five new proxy wars across the region untouched offense there let's go to their case at the top, we're going to say proxy wars outweigh the interstate conflicts they talk about in two ways. One is on probability. The CSS 12 finds that 90% of conflicts in the past 15 years have been proxy conflicts, not interstate. But second, even if they win interstate conflict, what God finds is that interstate proxy wars are 28% longer and two have two times more civilian deaths. So on that, they're a lot worse than interstate wars. On their contention about drones, at the top link level, Trevor Thick 18 finds the single largest deployment of US predator drones is in Afghanistan. Our evidence is seven years older than theirs. Clearly, US military policy has changed. We want more more drones in Afghanistan. But second, Zenko 12 finds the majority of our drones are surveillance. On their first impact about civilians, Atlantic 13 finds our drones kill at a 1.5% rate, which is comparatively lower than other counterterrorism mechanisms. But on, on state failure, once again, proxies that are better Lincoln. But second, it should have been triggered already by decades of drone strikes. On their second contention about Yemen, crossed by the ICG trend says leverage top 24 million people from dying. But second, they tell you that there's an 80% reduction. But no, remember, we tell you this 80% reduction happened in the context of US military presence. We had presence there. So clearly, they don't get offense on any of their Yemen advantage. Go to their third connection about the U.S.-Iran war. At the top, we specifically tell you, Gobashi 19, the Washington Post finds that U.S. deterrence actually preventing Iran from ever escalating any of its militias to reach any direct confrontation. But second, they say expansion will lead the U.S. to pull away from the table. But Rogan finds, no, sad, Iran will never compromise from a place of weakness, and there are sanctions in both worlds, so Iran will never compromise, which means there's no solvency. Um, can we see a couple of cards? First, can we see that, uh, that Parsi got the timeline wrong, whatever evidence that is? Secondly, can we see leverage saved 24 million lives? Um, also, the uh, proxy conflicts killed two times more civilians. Wait, I, actually, no, 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 Morgan, check your text. We don't, I don't think we need that. Oh, okay.
Wait, sorry. So you wanted the twenty-four million. Sorry, what was the other ones? I kind of I just forgot. Uh, so it's just two. Or actually, you know what? I I actually would like to see. So the date on the first response you read to Iran. That's all I need from there. But then the the actual two cards. Um, the card that Parsi's negotiation timeline was wrong, and then the tw like twenty four million people, like whatever that was. Do you want the year or the actual month on the first response? Both. Okay. Yeah, both. Actually, could you just uh, send send that card in general? Sorry, which card? Uh, the the first response to Iran, the the one that was in time that deterrence is a thing, and they're not like escalating. Morgan, did you get the site on that card? I missed it. The U.S. deterrence card. Yeah. No, I didn't get the site on it. In the Zoom chat, can you just type them so we can send them? Oh, Cards just type, type, type it there. So yeah, yeah so sure, it's like sure, the sure. Um, Yeah, sure. I just sent the ICG evidence and then the terminalizations at the bottom. Hasn't come through for me yet. Um, yeah, I just came through. Um, we will start running prep now. Okay, pausing prep. Just some one card. I, I, only one card has come through for me. Yeah, same. Uh, I just sent the dates on the Parsi evidence about the attack being two days before. It's just like two links with the different dates. Um, and then we're getting going. Wait, it's just like. Yeah, so the first Sorry. links, the, attack, the negotiations happened on September 12th. It's the article is written on September 12th. And then the other evidence says the Saudi Aramco attacks that your Parsi evidence talks about were September 14th. Wait, when you say links, do you mean like URLs or do you mean like is it cards? I sent two URLs, um, but I just put. Do you have the cards? I mean, so the, what I'm trying to say is it's just the dates of the cards, like the negotiations. I can just cut it. It's fine. If you want, I don't think it'll really be much. Better. I mean, yeah. Uh, I don't think we really even need that. Yeah. You, you don't need to like cut it, but yeah. 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 I'll, we'll just look at that, I guess. Morgan, do we want to start running prep when that, when that comes through? Uh, yeah. Cool. Read my text, by the way, before we do that. All right. Okay, it just came through for me. Okay, cool. Uh, wait, did you also send Iran deterred now? Uh, 
Oh no, actually that's not the the. the I'm sending it right now because I had okay. to cut because you wanted it cut. Oh, uh, Pranav, can you hit uh, reply all and resend those two links because you only sent those to me. Yeah, my bad. Sorry, I'll just I already cut the cards. Do the reply all for the. It's the same links. All right. Okay. So I just sent the two like date cards for Parsi. Okay, so okay. This is the um, answer to Parsi. Okay, and then the uh, Iran um, being deterred is the last one. I think Noah's in like about to send it, or he sent it. I already sent it. What's the name on that one? Just to be just to be sure. Kobashi. Kobashi. Okay. Okay, cool. All right, they all just came through. Um, so Morgan, do you want to call me? We'll run some prep. Yeah, I'll call you. We'll start prep once the call goes through. All right, we have about 15 seconds remaining. Sorry, what did you say? We have about 15 seconds remaining. Okay, sounds good. You ready for the cross? Yeah. Um, 
So uh, let's talk about this evidence from 2018 saying Yemen is an intractable conflict. Um, if that is true, why have there been brief periods where there have been ceasefires in the past? So, so there's, there's two things that are important to recognize here. One, the brief nature of the thing you just said proves that even if they get a small solution, the rebels just continue fighting. That's what happened after the 80% reduction you talked yep. about. It happened again in November. I, I, it happened again in March. Yep. I, fully, I, fully, I fully agree. And the reason okay. I agree is because of the mishandled first response, which is that the reason the rebels keep fighting is because Saudis won't give them concessions because of the security guarantee. No. So the reason why that doesn't make sense is because our Johnson evidence is independent of Saudi action, independent of Iran action. The groups on their own have their own incentives and um, like, like viewpoints in the conflict. They're just going to continue yeah. fighting. The That's, only risk of solving that is five true of also like, dude, like if, if Pranav, Pranav, that, that is true of Pranav. That is true of every war in human history. That doesn't mean it is intractable or can never be solved. Right. Wait. So, so the whole point, like we've been trying to solve the Syria and Yemen conflict for like four or five years now and nothing happens. Yeah, the only yeah that's the status quo. That's your world. Is five new conflicts that would also be similarly intractable. Like if what you're talking I about- I understand is, your claim, but you've already said that. I'm saying well, that the logic so I'm, behind I'm why we just say, oh, claim. it's intractable and we throw up our hands, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, I'm following, I'm following up my claim with a further warrant, right? The argument is that these conflicts are multifaceted. The best way to move forward may is most likely to stop these multifaceted conflicts from spreading throughout the region where they can wreak even more havoc. And now can I have a question? Yeah, every I'm conflict is multifaceted. Go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. Let's talk about your B warrant, um, your C3. So in order, like, is US military presence the only way the US pressures Iran? Um, it's the only way that triggers direct conflict because there's actual uh, military escalation between the two in Iraq happening now. Why as wouldn't, April. Why That's wouldn't the, the conceded Abood evidence? Why would the economic, you can just say that, but my question is why would the economic harms of sanctions push Iran to get more aggressive to defend themselves? Um, so it doesn't matter because even if Iran gets more aggressive, we don't have true presence in the region for them to attack and pull us into a war. Wait. So Wait, it doesn't have, like, link into the impact. Other scenario. stuff around the region. We have like permanent bases in Afghanistan. We have troop. We have boats in international waters. Yeah, not 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 in the parts near Iran. Also, Wait. again, you spend you five know, seconds you? answering this link by saying, "quote We can deter Iran." No warrant. That's no right. empirics. No explanation. I, I that is that. not sufficient said, to answer the argument. I said the U.S. presence prevents ir deters Iran from scaling its militias to attack because they're scared of Iran of the U.S. That's right. That is that is a claim. That is a claim. So why, did, why, why does it deter them? them? We need a warrant, but there, I, I didn't, there was the no warrant. The warrant is that they don't want to escalate a confrontation with the U.S. It's simple. Well, then you sh that should have been in rebuttal. Because okay, so why did really Soleimani not escalate like the nuclear war? Um, again, post Soleimani, they're escalating literally right now. Again, a boot from last week says they have re-escalated. So why did Soleimani also, that's, that's time. not escalate? We're, we're past time. That's fine, yes. Y'all taking forever. Uh, Morgan, do you need prep? No. Uh, Wait, actually, um, we got to take a, let's, let's take a couple seconds of prep just to, just so you can check this text. We'll start running prep now. All right. Ending prep. It's seven more seconds used. <clears throat> Are you all still taking print? No. Oh, sorry. I was. I meant to be talking to you guys. Uh, the the. Uh, I didn't know. I, was, I didn't know I was muted. The uh, there's like a lot of weighing stuff at the top, which is why the order is gonna like be kind of weird. It's gonna start on my case, um, and it's basically gonna be like top down, pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. Like in terms of like front lines, and then when I get to your case, the best way to think of it is just like just all, like straight all the way down, like, like line by line pretty much. Right, sounds good. Um, Cause like a lot of the Wayne debate is happening on like two different places, if that makes sense. So. Um, That's your case, my case. But yeah, it's basically my case, your case. And then I'll, and then I'll, I'll, I'll signpost so you guys know what's going on. Okay. Um, is everyone ready? 
They get to our contention theory with 15 seconds left in our bottle. It is not enough to take this out. The only response that they have is that the U.S. is there always deterring Iran from attacking. One hour, one hour evidence uh, is from 2020. It postdates them. And the reason that's important is since that evidence was written, tensions between the U.S. and Iran have escalated to the point where Iran sees it as an existential threat. Next, their evidence says that the rate, the way that Iran will escalate instead is through proxy conflicts. Our impact scenario says that it starts with the proxy conflict in Iraq. The Abedo evidence is really clear. Let's extend the link. The link says that uh, the United States' presence in Iraq is a existential threat threat to Iran and they're going to do everything they can to expel the forces out of Iraq unless we withdraw right away. The evidence is really good. It presents literally a binary between U.S. withdrawal or war that, with Iran that starts in Iraq. The reason that's, uh, the reason, like, it's, it starts as a proxy conflict is because Iran begins to start the war by funding proxy militias in Iraq and then that escalates to U.S. war. The Chusadowski evidence is really good. It says that the United States will strike Iran's nuclear reactors, which releases, causes, like, releases a lot of nuclear energy, causes nuclear fallout, killing millions of people. Again, this is not nuclear war. This is striking the nuclear facilities. It's just like Chernobyl. Let's look at uh, let's look at their uh, weighing. So they first of all they say that 90% of conflicts are proxy conflicts. Well, this conflict is the other 10%. Also, they don't link into all proxy conflicts. Next, they say that proxy conflicts kill two times more civilian deaths. That's answered by the war evidence of Jack, Jack reads in a bottle. It says that a potential U.S. Iran war will be the deadliest war that the region has literally ever seen, which is why which it makes sense because it's between like the U.S. and Iran. They're two huge powers. Next, on Yemen, on the ICG turn about like two, 24 million people. First of all, that like ceasefire like ended very quickly, and since then all other ceasefires have failed clearly it's not preventing enough also like and also like it's like the blockade is still going on so at that point um let's do some weighing let's 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 extend the weighing this is the weighing that jack did on their case in our bottle by the way um first of all answering their johnson evidence that says that the uh proxy conflicts are literally always locked in so you have to prevent future conflicts one there's no warrant for this is true and two that's clearly not true so, so far as uh ceasefires are happening next um let's extend the weighing on 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 our case why our case outweighs one on magnitude a, a direct conflict is, is it's much bigger than any sort of proxy conflict because a the the two countries fighting have much larger military capabilities and b um it draws in allies uh they respond is saying that there's no like mutually assured destruction means no nuclear uh, attack we're not doing a nuclear scenario next they totally dropped the prerequisite weighing that says that a direct conflict in the u.s iran expands to proxy conflicts even outside the middle east because uh, iran is trying to counter u.s influence literally everywhere in the world that means we link into stopping future conflicts even if you believe that all other conflicts are locked in that, that is clean drop it is a clean place to vote for us next let's extend some responses on our case first is the parsi evidence the parsi proves that our side is empirically true that the parsi evidence says that when the u.s threatened to withdraw its troops that means saudi arabia turned to diplomacy in Yemen and airstrikes decreased by uh, by uh, 80 percent. They say that they say that the timeline is off. Literally, the, the, even even if the uh, like the stop in violence happened before the withdrawal, they did it because the U.S. threatened to withdraw. They knew that the U.S. was already going to do it. That's why that happened. Next, um, extend the uh, uh, totally drop turn in the first contention that says that the uh, the everyone in the Saudi royal family is anti-U.S. and anti-imperialism. Meaning, meaning if the U.S. withdraws, it's seen as a victory for the royal family. Meaning they no longer to need to pursue uh, aggression in Yemen because they have a political victory. They don't need to be as aggressive. That's an independent warrant as to why they scale back and we solve the proxy problem. All right, uh, we're going to take a prep. Perhaps we have a minute left, but we'll probably stop. All right. Uh, we... One one second. Um, before if if before you want to take prep, if you you can you can send me this evidence after you've you've taken prep, or you can send me it before. But I just need to see. Um, your your brand's evidence so when the u.s moves out saudis push forward so i need to see that and then i also need to see uh the indicts to parsi um i think they they sent like i don't know if you sent that already um but if you have can you just point me to yeah, yeah i'm on the email chain All right. so it's the um email i sent for the parsi indict it's the one that starts in reuters 19. that's okay the, and i'll send the brand's evidence in a second once i go to my um my email and find it. Just to be clear, the indicts about the Reuters evidence and the Pamuk evidence, because they give the dates on the attacks and negotiation. Okay, okay. And can um, can you guys send me the Parsi, uh, uh, can AF send me the, the Parsi evidence separately, if they don't mind? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Morgan, go ahead, do that. What? Yeah. You gotta go like a little more away, I think. Why do you send ICG? Uh, yeah, you guys. Yeah, you ask for that later. Yo, Toronto, you should mute yourself. Your, your, oh, yeah. Your, 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 your. Okay, thank you. Okay, I just sent the Parsi evidence.
Um, so I just sent the brand's evidence. Or Raj, if you want to go look at the email chain. So we're going to start our prep now. Okay, that was 43, starting from, yeah. Um, so I'm just gonna condense all the weighing onto like the top of our case. Um, and then I'm gonna go, my case, our case, simple. Let's start on the wing. The intractability claim from Johnson first. They said there's no warrant for Johnson. The warrant for Johnson is in rebuttal and is well explained across. The argument is very simple. Proxy, proxy groups have their own individual motives for why they're in the conflict in the first place, which means top level diplomacy never works. This is really important way because it means the AF solvency mechanisms will never be implicated to reducing proxy conflicts because top level negotiations between like the US and Iran never function in de escalating conflict. Proxies are the only thing that matters. But second, on the probability claims, their response to the GOB evidence, which is floated on their case, we should move here now, is that they create the deadliest war, but GOB is comparative, which is important because it tells you that proxy wars cause two times more civilian deaths than interstate wars. This is really key because even if they say their war is the deadliest war ever, that means that our wars are comparatively two times worse. The neg is always a comparatively better ballot. But second, they can see the CNA evidence tells you even if Trump does the strike and only kill 200,000 people, it means we outweigh on severity insofar as Fisher talked about 5 million people. Now, let's go to my uniqueness scenario. There are a lot of problems here. They've completely conceded the Marcus 19 evidence that tells you after the Iranian revolution in 1979, Saudi Arabia views Iran as an existential threat. This means you have to vote neg. The entire lens of the round is through how Saudi Arabia we will react to Iran and how it increases aggression in the affirmative world. They have also dropped the Goldenberg evidence that tells you all the proxies and the status quo were started due to insecurity. As a result of Saudi Iranian competition, when the US pulled away and did small drawdowns, that means the uniqueness only flows neg here. They make two responses. The first response is that, oh, oh, oh. oh. So go back to the wing, they make a short circuit response about a nuclear conflict going to the Middle East. We tell you specifically, they've said that Iran is a regional actor. We agree that Iran only cares about the region. Iran will not be on the region, but second, the short circuit is never implicated to terminal impact. Okay, so back to the uniqueness. Now, under uniqueness, to their turnabout policy, there are two responses. They completely dropped the ICG evidence that tells the U.S. The U.S. through Trump has empirically used leverage to stop a full-on invasion which saved 24 million people. This is conceded offensively negative because it means we always outweigh all the Yemen negotiations and we outweigh their entire case. They never impact to this big of a terminal impact, 100% probability because it already happened. They read this policy evidence about a small decrease by 80%. One, it's short-term, but two, they have conceded the internet that tells you the reduction happened before negotiations happened, which are only due to U.S. presence. Now, Go to my second link. They try to extend, they turn on the first link. It doesn't matter. We're going for it. We can win the second link. There's no contextualization of how they can implicate the first link. On the second link, they have conceded the Hansaker evidence that tells you U.S. presence uniquely a single skin in the game and brands continues. Any use retreat would create a chaotic environment. They have dropped the leads evidence, which does the comparative and tells you security partners decrease the probability of conflict by 28%. Again, the neg is ahead on the comparative analysis. They have dropped deep in love, which tells you Saudi Arabia would fund new proxy groups and five new escalation hotspots, which Fisher said would kill five million people, but what it goes to step further than saying an existing conflict, that new funding would increase violence by 40%, increase civilian deaths by 40%. We're ahead on the flow. Go to their case. Only third contention about U.S. Iran. They really mishandle Gobashi. Their entire scenario is dependent on militias escalating, but Gobashi specifically isolates deterrence as the reason why I was preventing proxy escalation. They don't get access to any of their escalation impacts, terminal defense. That was three or five, right? Okay. So. 
No, I, I, I was confused about your banging. I thought it went way over. Yes. Yeah, no. Yeah, I, ha I have the last extension over time. Oh, sorry. But hey guys, whatever. We, do we want to okay. do a round? Sure. Uh, Jack. Oh, wait, sorry. My mind. My mind. Nothing, nothing. Oh, I was oh, just oh, muted on oh, the line. Could... I didn't hear what you said. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Doesn't matter. Um, can I have the first question? Sure. Um, so why does your weighing about proxy conflicts matter insofar as Morgan tells you that the Iran U.S. scenario begins with proxy escalation and it spills over into so other regions? That means if we not all that matters. That. Wait, so, so you're saying that your link is proxies, but we're, this is purely impact. No, 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 no. We link in through proxies. I, I agree. Your link is proxies. And it's also an impact. But your impact scenario is a U.S.-Iran confrontation. And so we're saying that the proxy or impact on our case, the impact level outweighs the impact level of a U.S. Iran conflict. Wait, 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 wait. But if it, we have an internal link that turns your argument. Right. So you're making a short circuit argument. I, I agree. I made it confusing. And the extra added impact of U.S. Iran. Right. I think it, it was a problem structurally with my speech. I, I messed up. I read the weighing and then I forgot to go short circuits. I went weighing, uniqueness, and then I went back to the short circuit. I made that very clear. I gave you like five seconds of pen time at least. I can repeat Thank the you. response if you missed it. Into the short No, I mean, if, if we all missed it, we all missed it. I mean, you can have a question. Well, I'm been on sure the floor. judges didn't miss it because I was very clear. <laughs> it's well, on the floor. Exactly. Enough for us to get it. I said go back and answer okay. Morgan's short right, circuit. Right, right, right. Sorry. You want to win your link? Yeah. yeah. In order for you to win your link, you have to win that Iraq will lash out, right, first? That, that who lash, lashes out? No, 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 no. We just have to win what's happening in the status quo is literally yeah. causing a war. You drop a boot from April who says that there's current, like, direct military conflict, like, happening in Iraq between these militias, and it's basically so, sucking us into an inevitable. Yeah, that's fantastic it's, it's, it's incredibly good. I urge everyone in the round to call for it. it, it, it okay, they just send it on the email chain if it's so it good. Specific, okay, I will. After this. Yeah. yeah. After yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That, um, <laughs> it says that there is a direct binary, right? It's either the U.S. pulls out of Iraq now, or there is a full-fledged confrontation between the U.S. and Iran. No, it's things are dodging the Iran question, Iran. right? We can agree. There's if it's happening the status quo, when does escalation happen between U.S. and Iran via proxy? Uh, first of all, we'd say it's pretty soon. Second of all, we'd say it doesn't really matter specifically when. Third, we'd say it's not really possible to nail down that timeline and you know it. And fourth, that's a brand new response in second crossfire. Or in grand crossfire. It's not a response. It's a waiting question. question. In grand cross, ask a question. I'm a question about the timeline. Really, but yeah, you can have a question. Okay, so um, so so far as um, the we all agree on the evidence that says that um, it is a political victory for the Saudi royal family if the U.S. pulls out, right? And your link says that political victories for the Saudi royal family mean that they don't have to be aggressive in Yemen because they have the political victories from somewhere else. Why does that not turn the link into uh, proxy conflicts? If, because, because if they have their political victory from US withdrawal, right? They don't need to get their political victory. Okay, so from this is not in conflict. summary though, it's my claim. And what yes, I say in is. summary yeah. is that well, no, you do not make the extensions. Any, no, any no, link extension. Okay, you just okay. say we turn the link. There's you no implication of how much you turn the link. But second and way more importantly, what? both links operate independently. We've done much more oh, weighing on the second link about external on, uncertainty. Come on, come on. You have two links into one impact. If also, I, I think that's... Links, we get fine. access to the impact. You can't just say that you're going for the second link and ignore it. No, I... That's um, why okay. I frontline it. Do people I think want we're, the evidence? Guys, yeah, the oh. evidence? yeah, yeah. Do people want the Abood evidence? Yeah, just go ahead and send it. There's no harm in sending it. All right, I'll send it to the email. Meg, I still need to see uh, uh, brands and that when uh, US moves out, Saudi moves forward. Uh, I, I sent it already. Which which one is it? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, ju I, I just saw it. My bad. Sorry. Yeah. Then I just sent the Abido evidence too. Um, when all that is finished, I'm ready to do my final focus if, if everyone's ready. Okay, I think that is a yes. It's going to go um, our case, Wang debate. Um, I think similar order as Noah did, then their case. Is everyone ready? They extend one response uh, in summary, two things. First, it is over time, don't evaluate it. Secondly, he extends through ink through Morgan's front line. He boot evidence is from April, it postdates. It indicates that Iran is escalating right now in Iraq. The evidence is literally fantastic. They're attacking forces right now, which is sucking us into an 
to an inevitable conflict. That's where our link comes in. We say that if we don't pull out of region and get out of Iraq, we're stuck into this inevitable conflict, where in the Chus Belsky Evans explains that America's war plan against Iraq is to strike nuclear reactors, which then causes a nuclear plume across half the Middle East, which wipes out the like massive amounts of the population and kills millions and millions of people. On to the weighing debate. We outweigh in a few ways. First is strength of link. This link got conceded in summary. Their case flow is very messy. It's the cleanest place to vote. The next thing they say is that we don't give a warrant, uh, uh, um, is on the, the conflict being intractable for the turns on their case. Again, they don't give, uh, they just said the reason, the warrant for why the conflicts are intractable is because they have motives. That's not a real warrant. Everyone has motives. But then they try to outweigh and say there will be more civilian casualties. But their gains evidence is not comparative to a U.S.-Iran scenario, just any interstate, interstate conflict. They still drop our warrant evidence explaining the U.S.-Iran would be the worst interstate conflict in modern history. Then they say that a Trump strike would only kill 200,000. Again, ignoring Morgan's front line. He ignores the Tusevelsky evidence explaining that the U.S. plan is to target Iran's nuclear reactors, which kills millions of people, half the Middle East. That the last thing then is the uh, is the proxy conflicts. The war evidence explains that if U.S. Iran escalation happens, proxy conflicts proliferate across Middle East and across Africa. That outweighs their stuff on scope because you get more proxy conflicts. All the ones they talk about, plus ones in entirely different regions. But then they have two new responses. Frame these through the idea that this argument was cold, dropped in rebuttal. Don't evaluate these new responses. I read this way in rebuttal. The first response is that it wasn't implicated. Yes, it was. The evidence says you kill hundreds of thousands. The second thing they say is that Iran doesn't want to fund. Iran funds militias across the entire world. They're the number one state sponsor of terrorism. On their case, the one thing we need uh, we need to extend is the Parsi evidence. The empiric is when we threaten to withdraw. They did diplomacy. This proves you can respond to existential threats through diplomacy. The second section is that they concede a turn, which is that um, uh, if you if you withdo if you reduce U.S. presence, anti-U.S. sentiment goes away, and the need for Saudis to lash out goes away. That means that's an independent reason why you get less proxy wars in our world from Saudi Arabia than you do in theirs. This was a dropped turn on one of their links. Very bad for them to drop. So vote pro. I have twelve seconds, right? Oh, yeah, sorry, th yeah, 13, so we're going to start now. Yeah. All right, so the order is going to be starting on the weighing, then going to our case, then their case. Is everyone ready? All right, yeah. So this round comes down to who you think is winning the weighing debate. We are so far ahead on the warrant level. They just say this is, quote, the worst interstate conflict. They do not interact with our GOP evidence. It says when you're comparing interstate to proxies, proxies are always A, 28% longer, and B, kill two times as many civilians. Even if they get a really bad interstate war, they've dropped clean warrants as to why proxies are always worse. But second, their terminal impact is severely mitigated. Our CNA evidence says the most likely Trump strike would kill 200,000 people, not the half civilian population they're talking about. They have dropped this evidence, which means we're already outweighing on scope. If we win our 5 million impacts in our case, they've dropped clean mitigation on their impact, which means we're winning the round on scope. We're A, ahead on severity, and B, ahead on scope. We're winning the weighing debate. Let's go to our case. Really easy, just place to sign your ballot is the untouched ICG turn that says U.S. leverage stopped an annexation of Saudi Arabia that would have killed 24 million people. 100% strength of link is conceded, and the impact outweighs our case. There's no terminalized extension in their case. But then they say that they can make Yemen worse. No, they don't interact with Johnson evidence really well. Johnson says the high-level negotiations will never trickle down to the small groups, which I quote, conflicts right now are intractable. The only thing you can solve is future conflicts. These 5 million people who are going to die in these new conflicts that Saudi Arabia would start. They read this link term that basically says Saudi Arabia gets support from withdrawal. There's not nearly enough work done on this term for you to even consider voting on it. They never say how much support they get, what the support tra transitions to in terms of proxy wars, or where they start this proxy wars. The turn is not well done at all. Don't vote on it. Go to our link, 100% conceded. Hunziker says U.S. presence signals skin in the game, and Brand says every time the U.S. draws down, Saudi Arabia moves forward. So I Leeds finds having a security partner decreases conflict by 28%. Deep says Saudi Arabia funds proxy groups in five new conflict areas, killing five million people, the biggest impact. But on their case, remember, first of all, they dropped the CNA evidence that severely mitigates their impact. But second, the Gobashi evidence says the Iraq groups will never escalate past the brink. They never explain what has changed in the status quo about tensions. There's no warrant as to why their post date matters. At the end of the round, 
they haven't won the fact that Iraq is not going to escalate no matter what. So there's never going to be a conflict and a severe mitigation of the impact. Please don't. Good bit. Around. Uh, okay, I think we're all in. <clears throat> we have all the judges. Judge one. Just say yes. Okay, we have all the judges. All right. Congratulations, everyone, for making it to the quarterfinals debate. The decision is a two-one for the pro. Uh, I don't know if there's a particular order. Raj, would you like to start, or uh, I can go? Uh, whatever you, whatever would you, would you like I to can, start? I can just, I can just go. Um, yeah. I voted, I voted for the pro. Um, I think the pro wins the Iran scenario. Um, the con is not responsive to the U.S. withdrawal makes the Kingdom Royals look good argument. The pro is able to weigh the U.S. Iran war and future proxy wars. I have doubt about the con's ability to access their proxy war scenario given the lack of specificity of that scenario and the limited response on the aforementioned link argument. Overall though, for all the debaters, um, I think you all should rely less on judges reading your or your opponent's evidence. Um, I think you should just say what it says and tell the judge what to do with it. And I think that'll save you a lot of time and help you better control the judge's interpretation of all the arguments in the debate. Yeah, I felt like there was uh, a lot that um, kind of was left for my interpretation and in digging the evidence. Um, so prefer that less in the future. Um, but this was a good debate, both sides. So I I agree with that analysis. So I voted for uh, pro as well. Um, so I thought that at the end of the round, for me, rather Saudi Arabia is going to become more aggressive or less aggressive if the U.S. withdraws seemed to me to be a wash. Um, and as far as the Yemen, um, in terms of saving... 24 million people through U.S. leverage. I thought Blake had answered that well by saying that the ceasefire ended quickly. U.S. leverage wasn't really successful there. And I felt that um, Khan had really undercovered um, the pro third contention um, on Iran so that I believe there's at least some probability that um, Blake wins their scenario that U.S. withdrawal is key to making it less likely that U.S. and Iran get drawn into a war. Um, and I think that there is at least some probability that this war could lead to an attack on an Iran, Iran nuclear facility that would have the potential to kill millions through, through the fallout. Um, as to the proxy war analysis, so Khan was saying proxy wars are kill two times more than um, interstate conflict. But I thought that Blake had answered that well by saying first, that's just generic evidence that's not specific to answering this, the Iran US risk of war. And second, Blake was from the very beginning explaining how a US Iran conflict would dramatically increase proxy wars globally anyway. So th therefore, the argument that the proxy war would outweigh it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and the cons evidence in terms of that we wouldn't do a nuclear strike that uh, against Iran, that we would do a conventional strike. So of course, the two problems with that is, is that that doesn't actually say that we wouldn't do a conventional strike against a Iranian nuclear facility, which is what Blake's scenario was in the first place. And second is, is that the Khan evidence actually supported 
Blake's position by saying that there was a decent probability that the US would conduct a nuclear strike. Um, so that's that's where I came down. Okay. Okay, so I guess I guess I'm last. Um, so I'll just start by kind of breaking the debate down into like frontiers of clash, I guess. So um, overall, I thought it was an excellent debate with a lot of nuance and fascinating arguments. Uh, I was really impressed with both teams uh, ability to kind of take really complex information, synthesize it and then present it in a new light. Um, but ultimately, I ended up voting NEG. Uh, the first reason was the weighing analysis on proxy wars versus interstate conflict. So NEG clearly demonstrated to me that even if interstate war breaks out, proxy wars are not only more probable to break out because of geopolitical fault lines in the Middle East right now, but that they would kill millions more. And this is backed up like through years and years of historical precedent. Um, and it's also backed up by like where the trend lines are shifting right now. And they presented that very clearly in round. Um, proxy wars took the same effort to resolve. That was NEG response. They last way longer. And the brand's evidence they showed me um, demonstrates that alongside historical precedent, when the USA pulls out, the Saudis get more aggressive. I didn't feel like AF was very responsive to this argument throughout the round. Um, I did evaluate the Parsi evidence, but the problem was like what I like again. I think the um, one of the uh, the first judge uh, uh, commented on this. She said that um, you know when you when you're uh, forcing us to kind of evaluate the evidence, it becomes very hard instead of telling me like what it means and how I should weigh it. And why? So I had to do a lot of my own direct reading to see it. Um, so the problem with the Parsi evidence was that airstrikes were down when the US was still active in the region. Um, also, each ceasefire timeline was too short, which is what Meg articulated. Each ceasefire collapsed. And the Johnson evidence plus the warrant showed me that trickle down diplomacy just doesn't work with rebel groups like the Houthis. So I don't trust them as an actor. Um, and you didn't tell me as an AF why I should trust them as an actor to create solvency for the Yemeni civil war. So I have to drop your solvency on Yemen. Um, moreover, the ICG turn was untouched and extended cleanly through ink alongside the Leeds evidence, which was a powerful historical tool as well. Uh, AFS frontlined in Neg's response regarding the fact um, that like, okay, mutually assured destruction exists in the Middle East anyway, so nuclear war uh, won't break out, um, was insufficient in maintaining your link into the impacts of nuclear war. Uh, so AF was correct uh, regarding your April, 2020, evidence concerning uh, escalation in the status quo right now. But you, but what Ned said was very, very, very uh, apt, which was that you don't tell me why this flare up right now is different from previous flare ups. And you don't respond to the merits of existing US deterrence and the status quo against Iranian proxies that is happening right now. Uh, even though it, it was a last minute response and rebuttal, um, like I, and it was extended again in summary. So I, count, I, I counted it. Um, so the Abood card that you guys had was a really good piece of evidence, but it didn't provide me with any timeline or clarity as Neg pointed out. And the proxy war analysis versus interstate war weighing was very clear alongside the fact that it's most certain that if the US pulls out proxy wars are simply going to escalate. Um, I had to drop your offense on drones uh, because failed states were not specified. Most drone strikes are occurring in Pakistan. You guys cited Libya, but you didn't show me the causality of drone strikes concerning Libya's status as a failed state. Um, and you didn't tell me where states are failing now because of drone strikes. I know you dropped that piece of offense, but uh, I'm, I'm just telling you like my reasoning for why I couldn't weigh it. And then Neg's weighing on, again, on the near certain likelihood of proxy wars if the US pulls out was enough to outweigh any potential harm of, of drone strikes. But overall, I thought the debate was excellent and uh, all of you did a great job. So really well done. I just have one really quick question. I don't know if the other did is here. Just like curious where y'all fell on the like thing that Raj talked about at the end, like the defense on the Iran, like the post date versus our older evidence on like why there won't be an escalation. Um, I mean, I don't have a specific comment on it. I just thought that overall, I felt that there was enough probability of um, of Blake winning their overall scenario. All right. Thank you.